commitment. Day three. Now we've talked about the, the determination of whether you have the quality of commitment is determined by where you spend your time and where you spend your money. When you sit down, and I used to do this all with my uh, classes and athletes, take a 24-hour day and write down, in a 24-hour day, just write down everything you do. In other words, if you slept eight hours last night, write down eight hours sleep. If you spent three hours on the cell phone, write down three. You know, just be honest. Don't give it to me. Just look at it. Now, after you look at that 24 hours, just one day, keep track of everything you do that day. Then right out there beside it, a sign that says equal, and then write what you're committed to. Oh, boy. sometimes it really hurts. Now, sometimes it makes you feel like a million dollars because you're committed to being a great student and you're spending seven hours a day studying or in a learning position. Or you want to be an elite athlete and you're spending six hours a day in the practice that coaches have or the weight room or whatever you're doing, but you're spending the time. And you can put out there a commitment to be the elite, whatever it might be. But if it's the cell phone and it's the video games, then you're going to be elite in the video games. And if there's ever a professional league of video players, you're going to be right at the top. Or if there's ever a uh, class of elite cell phone users, you're going to be right at the top. But that 24 hours can tell you what you're committed to. Now, sometimes you can have a forced commitment. I mean, you are, you are forced to commit to two hours a day, probably, if you're an athlete. So that's a forced commitment. It doesn't mean you're going to gain anything out of it if you don't sit down and make a plan for it. You're not going to become purpose-driven because you want to be. You're going to have to sit down three goals a day and get good at it. And if you don't make the three goals, you don't kill yourself. You don't say, I'm sorry, I'm a loser. That's how I'll never get this. You didn't get it today. That don't mean you're not going to get it tomorrow. What you do is you write down a minus, and then you write down, why didn't I get it? And then you write down, what am I going to do differently tomorrow? There it is. You're better the next day and the next day, and the next day. Now, today's story is about forced commitment. Here's the story. In 1519, Hernan Cortez landed in Veracruz, Mexico, with his men in hopes of exploring a new world. 1519. His men were weary and afraid of the unknown territory. To ensure that his men had no other option but to continue, Cortez ordered the ships burned. By doing this, there was no turning back to the old world. The men had to go forward and accept the many changes and challenges that faced them. These guys got off the ships and they're camping and they're sitting there and they're going, well, if it doesn't work out, we'll get on the ships and go home. No big deal. They're being compliant. They're doing what they're told. Cortez burned the ships. Now they don't have a, chance, a choice. Now they've got to be successful where they are. It's really the way it is. That's what Terrence Shaw did. He burned the ships. When he sat in that cafeteria... And those guys gave him a hard time. He burned the ships. He said, I don't care. I'm moving forward. I'm not worried about what other people think. The fog will not stop me. I have a vision. And I'm going to get to that vision. See, you got to burn the ships. And I don't, that's a metaphor. But you have to make a decision on what you're going to do. If it's a Christian life, you got to burn the ship back to those ways of evil. You got to burn those. You can't be both. 
That's what's called a hypocrite. One that says one thing and does something else. You got to burn the ships back to those evil people and their evil ways. If you're going to be committed to being an athlete, that's not a two hour a day job. Committed to being an athlete, spending $10,000, you say, Coach, that's, in, that's un, impossible. You can't work out six hours a day. Can you eat right? Can you make sure that everything that's going into your body, in other words, you got to burn the ships to Coca-Cola. Oh, Colts, why'd you have to say that? you got to burn the ships to potato chips? See, if you're going to eat nutritionally, you're talking about six hours a day, you're going to prepare to be an elite athlete, then eat nutritionally. Make sure when I go to that cafeteria, I'm going to spend an hour in that cafeteria making sure that I'm getting to my goal. When I eat my dinner tonight, I'm going to make sure I'm getting there. I'm going to get up and eat breakfast in the morning so that I'm not really hungry at, at lunch and eat the wrong things. So that's three hours a day you're talking about. You don't have to go out and practice for six hours or be in a weight room for six hours. Three hours of that can be to make sure your body is fed nutritionally. If you go to classes and every class you're in, you determine you're going to do the homework, do what the teacher asks, and be committed to doing the best you can do in that class, that's another five hours of becoming an elite athlete because it gives you the opportunity to go further in life. That's eight hours, and you haven't even gotten to the practice field yet. Now, you spend the two hours on the practice field, and then you stay 15, 30 minutes later and do your stretching and <clears throat> do those things. The great athletes, they get in the ice tub after. When practice is over, they don't leave. Get in the ice tub so they can get their legs back. They may lift some weights. They may do something. We went to the... Uh, the Fort Worth Open, the Colonial, when you're a friend of mine. And he had a friend that was a professional golfer. And the guy, his tee-off time was at 9 in the morning. He got up and he practiced from 7 to 8.30. He went to the tee. He had a good, bre he had a good breakfast before he started, had a good night's sleep. He played 18 holes, and he visited with us for a few minutes. And uh, we said, you want to go and get something to eat? And he said, no. <clears throat> <clears throat> I really have to work on my chipping. So I'm going to go to the driving range and work on my chipping for an hour, hour and a half. And then I'll, get, I'll meet you guys to eat. What? He practiced for an hour and a half before he played the 18 holes. He played 18 holes. And then he went and practiced an hour and a half on what he didn't do well. I want to be a professional golfer. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. You want to go play 18 holes and say, I played pretty well. I'm getting pretty good. No, it's 10,000 hours. And you got to burn the ship to those things that prevent you from doing it. Question number one, what do you think was the response of the soldiers in the burning of the ships? Their winter excuses. <laughs> Thou, Lord, have mercy. Don't you know that they were mad at that guy and, and just couldn't believe that they had to stay there and do what they had to do? Number two, we all have to burn ships in growing up. How different is this? See, we've got to put away the things of being children and start being men and women. We've got to burn the ships to spending all of our time on cell phone and video games and stuff that doesn't have any positive influence on our lives. We got to start using our hours and our time effectively. Many people struggle with having the willingness to take the risk necessary of success. How does the story determine the willingness to take risk? They didn't have a choice. <clears throat> they had to take risk. There are so many athletes in this world today that don't play athletics because they're afraid of failure. 
there's so many people that are that don't take the right classes because they're afraid of failure. Burn the ship. Take the risk. You'll get there. It's going to be a great day. You be the best you can be and make this a great day.